Welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and this is episode number 137, Free Will and the Mental Health System. The idea behind this episode is that, like, you would think that the mental health system that is involved with basically s sanity, what's, 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 you know, what's correct in thinking as opposed to what's incorrect, would really understand this, this, this issue of free will would understand that we don't have it and implement this understanding within its treatment mod modalities, but it really doesn't. You know, it, it, it basically what it does, it ignores the issue. So we'll, we'll just explore that in more detail. Okay, but as we do before each show, we're going to first um, define what we mean by free will, what the mental health system means by free will, why we, what we all mean. And you know, refute it briefly. I want to actually, in this show, I want to refute it not in the most fundamental way, but in the way that relates most to psychology, most to, to mental health, because mental health is really about psychiatry, psychiatry, and psychology, whatever. So, um, and then, like, you know, after that, I just um, want to just talk a bit briefly about why this is, like, such an important p topic, why this, you know, this is actually revolutionary. It's, it's world-changing. All right, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to br be brief with this first part. Basically, when when people say they have free will, when science and psychology, medicine say, you know, what they mean by the term free will is that we can choose what we choose, we can do what we do, act how we act, independent of anything that's not in our control. Okay, that we can circumvent factors or influences that we can't control. Now, right there, um, we have an unconscious. Our unconscious is like, I'm going to explain this in more detail in a bit, but the unconscious is where all our memories are stored, and we can't control the unconscious. By definition, we're not even conscious of it. But like, if, if all the data for our decisions is based, is, resides in the unconscious, that'll tell you the decision-making has to be the unconscious. So that's so basically, it's about conscious control, and so like, the the term free will means we we would be able to circumvent or override or supersede th these kinds of um, you know. And, and another thing that we're not in control of, for example, is causality. And just the basic fact that everything has a cause. If if there's a chain of cause and effect that stretches back to before we were born, and it's ultimately causing what we do, then that's a kind of like. Um, a causal process we have no control over, and that's determining our, our decisions. Um, genetics is another way of explaining this. Our our genes are like 50% of our per personality is based on our genetics. The other 50% is based on like you know how we were raised, where we were raised, um, other factors like that. So the point is like if if 50% of of who we are, of who are, what our basic personality is, is genetic. That'll tell you right away that, like, you know, these genes are responsible for 50%, it would seem, of the behavior that's, you know, that's being expressed by our personality. All right. So that's the basic definition of free will and, you know, a few reasons why it's impossible. Why is this important? Um, ordinarily, I go through a, a quote by this philosopher, John Searle, who's the 13th most cited philosopher post-1900 in the world, and, well, I might as well say it. He, he says that for free will to be found and acknowledged by the world to be an illusion would be a bigger revolution in our thinking than Einstein or Copernicus or Darwin or Galileo or, or um, Newton. <laughs> I changed the order around. It would, it would alter, he, he also said, it would alter our whole conception of our relation with the universe. That's how big this is, all right? But within the mental health field, it's like it's big because... Free will is a profound, it's like, it's a collective delusion. It's like, you know, it permeates every institution. It permeates religion, um, politics, government, education, you know, economy, socioeconomy. It, it's like, it's part of our, you know, justice, judicial system. It's part of our culture, part of our civil civilization, and the world is completely deluded. And the mental health system is to a great extent about helping people overcome delusions. Okay, so, so, um, and I'll get into this more in detail. 
All right. So let me let me again, you know, describe why free will is impossible, why we don't have a free will from the psychological perspective of the unconscious. Okay, again, the basic reason it's impossible is because of causality. If everything has a cause, there's a causal regression from every cause, cause that spans back to before we were born. This cause and effect is dominoes. Imagine like dominoes, you know, each, each cause, each domino being a cause, and each domino being like a moment back in time. So you have this, this chain of cause and effect that precedes our birth. So obviously if events that are happening before we were born are leading up to what we do, you know, in this causal cause and effect manner. Obviously that makes real impossible. But all right, so like the idea with the unconscious, um, the way to understand how the unconscious makes free will impossible is like another definition of free will is like that we are consciously willing something. In other words, if, if we were unconsciously willing it, that's not what we mean by free will. You know, that that wouldn't be an example of free will because basically like the unconscious is something we're not even aware of. You know, that's, <clears throat> by definition, it's unconscious. You know, it's like we have a conscious mind and we have un unconscious. So, one way to understand why the unconscious makes free will impossible is to understand that um, our consciousness is about awareness. To be conscious of something is to be aware of something, okay? Um, consciousness is not about decision making. You know, to be aware is different than deciding. Okay, that's one thing. Second thing is, again, as I said, our conscious mind is not aware of the unconscious. And that's why they call it the unconscious. Okay. Um, a third thing is like whenever we're making a decision, a lot of our decisions are ling linguistic. They're based on words and concepts that we ha concepts we have stored in our memory. Now think about it. Consciousness is an awareness mechanism. It's not a data storage mechanism, right? So that means that um, whatever memories we have, memories of words, memories of concepts, memories of experiences, all those memories, all that data has to be stored at the level of the unconscious. You know, it has to be because, again, like consciousness is also fleeting. Consciousness is really just like right now I'm conscious of something. The next moment I'm going to be conscious of something else. The same for you, same for everyone. Consciousness changes moment by moment. Sometimes you can be conscious of a few things, at more, you know, more than one thing at once. But ordinarily, you just it's kind of like a, a stream of consciousness, you know, one thing and the next. All right, so, so the idea is like you have all the data. If we're making a decision, it's got to be based on something. If we're going to like decide between eating an apple and an orange, you know, what does an orange taste like? What's an orange apple taste like? Um, you know, what, uh, how have we experienced apples and oranges in the past? I mean, these are like memories. So again, they're stored in the unconscious because they can't be stored in the conscious part of our mind, whatever. And so naturally the, the, the very strong conclusion is that if this data is in the unconscious and the, uncon and the conscious mind cannot access that data because it's in the unconscious, the decision, the processing of the data has to also occur at the level of the unconscious. In other words, if the information is there, the only part of the mind that has access to that information is the unconscious. And the last thing to do with that is that, like, not only is the data there, but, like, for example, with, with choosing between an apple and an orange, there are principles upon which we decide what we decide. Now, consciously, when we're making decisions, like, we're not going to ourselves, well, now, what, what criteria am I going to, like, use? Like, you know, we might, part of it might be taste, part of it might be, like, well, um, when's the last time I, I ate an, an orange? When's the last time I ate, ate an apple? And all? Is it right to eat an apple versus an orange? Um, you know, we have these principles. Is it logical? Can we actually, you know, eat an apple? Can we eat an orange? And all? So these principles upon which you decide. Again, these principles are not part of our, our consciousness. We, we, we're not like, we're not sifting through all these principles each time we make a decision because they're in the unconscious. Again, consciousness is limited to awareness. Okay, so we may be aware that we're making a decision. We may be aware of the result of the decision. But the actual decision, what, what, actu what happens most precisely is like the unconscious decides and then it makes us aware of what it has decided, okay? And it might make us aware of 
some of the reasons it's decided as it has. But again, because the data, the principles, and the processes of the decisions are all based in the unconscious, free will is impossible. All right. Now, that's a, that's a psychological refutation of free will that does not in any way depend on causality or determinism. You know, it's, it's about the unconscious. Um, Daniel Wegner, a uh, psychologist, Harvard psychologist, wrote a book in 2002 called The Illusion of Conscious Will. He goes into this in, in extensive de detail with exhaustive documented empirical evidence. Okay, so this isn't theory, this isn't hypothesis, this is like, you know, it's just like scientific fact, really. Okay, um, so the mental health system. <laughs> I mean, and, 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 you know, you can't blame them. Again, the, the, an important thing about, like, not having free will is, like, we don't blame anyone for anything. We might hold ourselves and others accountable pragmatically to hold up, you know, rule of law and our system of, of you know, social norms and, and mores and all that stuff. But it, it's without blame, okay? So basically, like, while they're not to blame that our mental health system, not just in the United States, but I think throughout the world, is completely deluded, I mean, like, it, about this issue. <laughs> if they weren't deluded, then you would see in textbooks and, in, 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 you know, psychotherapy um, guidelines and, and, and manuals and stuff, the fact that we have a free will and how it impacts, you know, the kind of therapy that might take place. So, but the problem is that the mental health system pretty much ignores this problem. You know, it just ignores the question of whether we have a free will. It kind of assumes that we do. And this is kind of like, it's ironic because like, you know, the mental health system is, it's a medical system. It's a medical system and it's a psychological system, okay? It's involved with psychiatry. So this, so it's basically a scientific system. And like, what happens is when, when we're in school, when we're all in school, you know, probably ele elementary school, maybe junior high school, we're taught that human behavior is the result of nature and nurture, heredity and environment. Okay, <clears throat> for I got to take a drink. For for years, for decades, I think there was a debate in science as to whether human behavior was the result of nature or nurture. Whether some behaviors. In most cases, there, there are, you know, with humans, there are some completely instinctual behaviors that aren't dependent on the environment at all. There are some completely, well, this, no, there are some behaviors that are, I would have to say, predominantly or, or majorly um, dependent on heredity, um, on, an, on environment, rather, on, on just circumstances, what we learn and all. But, and, but they do have, you know, you can't, you can't um, completely ignore the genetic component in, in any, of, any of this. You know, that's part of it. But, all right, so we understand this. You know, we've been taught this since elementary school, junior high school. And, but within that learning, there's never this third option. You know, human behavior is like a product of heredity, environment, and free will. Okay, because free will, you know, so that, that, should tell, that should tell people, psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, mental health um, therapists, that, that we don't have a free will, okay? Because it's not within the, uh, our understanding of how, <coughs> of human behavior. Okay, um, so what's the problem? Um, well, one, it's, it's like that, that the mental health system ignores this, and then we'll get into why it would be beneficial for them to not ignore this because this actually could be a, a powerful treatment modality but like but it's even worse than that because like for example um, in psychiatry there's this manual um, that psychiatrists and other mental health professionals use to kind of like assess and diagnose and treat um, various um, conditions related to thinking emotions you know mental mental health whatever it's called the DSM the Diagnostic um, S Manual. I don't, I don't know what S is about. And, and like they, they revise it every so often. I think they're up to DSM-5 now. But um, I've got a copy of the DSM-4, their most you know, recent copy before that. And basically, when you turn to like the section on psychosis, like there are three major types of psychosis, schizo, 
schizophrenia, bipolar, and schizoaffective. You know, and then they're categorized into various sub um, categories, whatever. But the DSM-4 very specifically and very directly states that like one of the criteria for, for a person to be placed within that designation of, of being quote-unquote psychotic is that they believe that their actions and thoughts are coming from outside of them, that, they, that, they're, that they're not in control of their own thoughts, whatever. And I mean, like, you got you to gotta appreciate the, the very sublime irony of this because like, you know, essentially because we don't have a free will, because free will is completely an illusion, we never had it, we don't have it, we never can have it, um, nothing is in our, our control. Our thoughts in our, are not controlled by us, our emotions aren't controlled by us, our actions aren't controlled by us. Okay, so like, so you've got like this manual, this psychiatric manual, listing as their criteria, one of their criteria for psychosis, this this truth that like the people, in other words, there are a lot of people who 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 either have come to conclude or sense that their behavior, their actions, feelings aren't there, that they're coming to them from from outside of themselves. All right, granted, granted, a lot of these patients, a lot of these people might say, well, you know, there's, I think there's an electrode planted in my brain, or, or I think aliens have abducted my mind and taken over my mind, or I think I ate something and whatever. They might come up with their outlanded, bizarre explanations to explain why they're not in control of their behavior or their thoughts and feelings and stuff. But, you know, you have to consider that, you know, just the fact that they, that they recognize that, that something outside of them is controlling what they think, say, and do, and feel is actually more closer to the truth than what's, what's being held as, as, as the criteria for psychosis by, by the medical, you know, mental health professionals, all right? So another, what I'm trying to say, these people that are sometimes um, labeled psychotic are more in touch with reality than the people who are supposed to be treating them, who, who um, in many cases either don't address the question of free will or actually believe we human beings have one, okay? So it's like, it's a problem. It's like, you know, it's, it's an irony. It's, it's kind of funny. All right. Um, so um, now here's the thing. In psychology, um, basically psychology is about, at least the mental health profession, is about changing emotions, changing behavior. And how do we do this? Um, we can go back to Freud. Freud back in... I don't know, late 1800s, I'm not sure when, when he was around, um, maybe mid-1800s, I don't know. He, um, he came up with what we know as the talking cure now. He, he kind of like said that like a lot of, that just simply by talking, by understanding why we think what we do, why we feel what we do, we can feel better, we can understand ourselves better, we can overcome these certain delusions or illusions we have about ourselves and others, and... Incidentally, Freud understood that, that we don't have a free will. You know, he had that understanding. Um, Freud is credited mainly for, not for discovering that we have an unconscious, but for promoting and pop, pop, um, popularizing that fact, you know, publicizing it. But, but, you know, basically, therapy, at least, at least the talking therapy, the psychotherapy, is generally behavioral, you know, um, cognitive behavioral. It's, it's based on, like, understanding thoughts, understanding behavior, and changing our thought patterns, changing our behavioral patterns to result in, in desired outcomes, you know, less anxiety, less depression, you know, more, more, po more happiness, more, more positive feelings. So here's the thing. This process, this, this psychotherapeutic process that's based on talk, on discussion, on, you know, restructuring of our cognitions, it's a causal process. In other words, like, the idea is, like, if we go through this therapy or if we do it on our own, if we, if we consider these thoughts or, like, um, change our behaviors, change our habits, then we can expect a different outcome, you know. And if we don't, we can't. This is like, you know, there's a, there's a kind of like a definition. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So, like, psychotherapy 
is, is about causality. It, it, it understands this, but again, like the problem with mental health system today is that while they implicitly, implicitly understand it, they don't explicitly use it as a treatment modality. You know, they, they, they just like, they ignore it. Okay, and the other thing is like, there's two kinds of ways of treating mental illness, mental conditions, whatever. One is like what I just mentioned um, through the talking therapy, whatever, dialogue, discussion, all. The second is psychopharmacological. In other words, um, relying on medicines, medications and all. So here's the thing, so like, if we're gonna address the mental health system and like just like the, the, our health, the health of, of individuals, the mental health of, of our society within this psychopharmacological model, I mean, it's all, it's, bio, it's biology, it's neuroscience. So like that is all causal. In other words, like if we're gonna rely on, on that understanding of, of why we change, then clearly if, if, if a person's feeling depressed, for example, and you give them an antidepressant, and they are no longer feeling as depressed, that'll tell you, you don't have, they don't have a free will. Because like basically they weren't in control of that agent that made them feel better. Um, with the psychotropic medications, you know, medications that, that will make a person who has certain kinds of delusions not necessarily related to this, have less of them, have less hallucinations or whatever. Again, um, the medication alters the behavior, alters the, the thought patterns, alters the, the emotional uh, processes in a way that will minimize or reduce or eliminate certain kinds of like psychotic experiences. That's a completely biological causal process. So you have, what I'm trying to say is you have like the two principal, perhaps the two only modes of, of treating, you know, people with, within the mental health system, talking and and medicine both um, providing very, very strong, irrefutable evidence that, that basically our behavior, our emotions, our, our cognitions are causal. You know, that like, you know, you do something, you get a result, you know. And again, the, these things are not within our control. I mean, you might say that like with the medication, you, you know, you take the medication of your free will, but no, because like you have to understand that like to the extent you take a medication, there has to be cause for it. So uh, essentially what I'm saying, or, that the, the decision is based at, at the unconscious level as we described before. All right, so now, so now that we understand, you know, why the mental health system has been remiss, kind of like, you know, why they've ignored this or, or just the fact that they have, let's talk briefly, I, I've got a bit less than five minutes of how it would help for the mental health system to begin to implement this truth that we don't have a free will into their treatment modalities, into their, like, especially, the, it, this isn't gonna be psychopharmacological because you know, it's involved with thoughts, with cognitions, but like, for example, a lot of people feel depressed, let's say because they didn't, they're not the kind of people they wanna be. You know, they don't have the success that they wanna have, they don't have the life they wanna have, and a lot of times the problem is the depression stems not from so much not having or being the, the, the person they wanna be, but they blame themselves. A lot of times you'll hear in psychiatry, psychology, um, depression is anger turned inward, okay? Anger by definition in psychology is a reaction to a perceived injustice. So they're actually blaming themselves for their failures, for their you know, limitations and all, and that results in this guilt that, that is very painful and that, that, that's kind of like a prime engine for depression. Okay, so the, to the extent that, that um, patients you know, within the mental health system can be taught, can be instructed like, listen, um, you don't have a free will, nobody has a free will, so like, yes, certainly you, you have these failures, but they're not your fault. That will alleviate a lot of this guilt, a lot of this like self-crimination, uh, recrimination. Okay, another area that it can be used, in, and, and incidentally, you know, while teaching these, um, you know, patients, people within the mental health system that we don't have free will, you have to like, the caveat here is like, you, you say, listen, this doesn't give you license to do whatever you, you want or think whatever you want because our actions and our thoughts, our feelings have consequences, all right? You have to, you always have to say that so people don't think that, well, I can get away with anything because I don't have free will and you can't fundamentally blame this, all right? But once you've done that or one, once the patient or the, the, the client understands that, another benefit that comes from understanding that we don't have free will, there is so much conflict in relationships. Like I think like 
several decades ago, the, the average person had three or four or five friends. Now it's, I think, down to one. You know, we're becoming increasingly isolated. The divorce rate for um, single um, first marriages, it still hovers around 50%, and that's been, I think, the case for decades. Um, today, I just learned recently, one out of every four women in their 40s and 50s, 25% of women in their 40s and 50s are on antidepressant medication. I mean, that, that'll tell you how profoundly dysfunctional our, our whole society is. And again, if you tie it in with the guilt that stems, it is a, is a pretty unavoidable result of free will belief, you can understand how important this, this delusion of free will is in, in perpetuating the kinds of beliefs that, that lead to a lot of unnecessary, in my opinion, um, you know, pain and, and suffering among people. There are many other ways that, like, you know, explaining to people that they don't have a free will could help their relations with, with others, could help their perception of the world. Okay, um, all right, I think I've covered this. I think I've covered this well enough. I'm going to go into, I've got about a minute and a half. I want to do a few commercials. This is episode 137 of this show. We've been on since um, January of 2011, I believe. Um, the, the episodes are all on YouTube. I've, I've run a meetup that I started April 7th, 2010, and it's a monthly meetup. It, it meets in Manhattan in the Sony Plaza between 55th and 56th Streets, like between Madison and 5th Avenue. Okay, that's every... the. Um, the first Saturday of each month at 2 o'clock. Okay, we've got a live show in Manhattan. We're not live all the time, but it's on um, MNN, the Manhattan Neighborhood Network, Channel 57, I believe, and that's on at 11 o'clock every Wednesday. I did a, a live show last night. We've got the website. The website is Exploring the Illusion of Free Will, causalconsciousness.com. And like my, my former partner who comes back as a, as a, as a guest now, now, every now and then, because he can't be, a, you know, he doesn't have time to do this, whatever. But he and I and some others of us have really like been bringing this from, from academia into the mainstream. And it, 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 we're, we're making a difference. People are beginning to think about this and understand this. And as we do this, we can create a much better world. Okay, I hope you understand how the mental health system can be benefited by this, and I'll be back to explain more about this in later shows. Thanks for watching.